conversation forward for all of us. Um, he put uh, Dr. Phillips and I and Neil on his uh, Emmy Award winning show, uh, his special, Lime and Reason, and we were so proud to be part of it. Um, so I have to thank Norma for introducing us at Dr. Oz's show. I guess I have to thank Dr. Oz one day when we're, when we're on his show talking about Lyme disease. Um, that's got to be on the list for all of us. Um, so I'm, I'm really thrilled that I'm well enough to be on a stage again. Um, and I want to thank the remarkable team here at Lyme Connection, uh, Karen Guardian and Jennifer Reed. They have been so supportive of us personally and have helped thousands of people over the last 15 years with this organization. Um, and I don't think I've ever shared with any of them uh, that they serendipitously led me to Dr. Phillips and led me here tonight. And, uh, and I'll tell you about that later. Um, and first, I was curious how many of you are newly diagnosed? Feel a bunch, okay. And how many are you? How many people feel there's no hope? I'm never going to get better. This is the end of the road. So I, I hope that my presence and my story here gives you strength and hope tonight. Because three and a half years ago, I was any of you who felt like that. I was dying. Um, I was in heart failure. I was not able to leave my apartment. I was extremely hopeless, and I could find almost no stories of recovery online or anywhere. I was saddled with crushing fatigue and insomnia and suicidal depression. Now, I never had any of this before. Um, horrible anxiety, a sense of doom, a sense of dread, weakness, pain, tingling in my hands and feet. I couldn't think, I couldn't follow a simple conversation or a simple story. I had a lot of hallucinations before I went to bed. I was seeing melting faces every time I closed my eyes and I would stay up all night crying and praying to God to help my family and my friends through my impending death because I was absolutely certain I was gonna die soon. Um, and I do believe that without the proper care, I might have. So um, a little bit about my background. Um, I was basically born singing and songwriting, and I knew I was gonna do that from the time I was a little tiny girl. I told my mom at four years old, uh, we were in the car driving, and do you guys remember that song? That's the way, uh-huh, uh-huh, I like it. Yeah, that was on the radio. And I knew every word, and I was like, Mom, I am gonna be a singer when I grow up. And she was like, okay. And so I was. Um, I, loved, I loved the connection that I felt with music, and I loved how I felt so understood. Um, I loved words, and I was always transfixed by genuine emotion and truth and honesty and a soulful voice. Um, and I knew that what mattered to me most was connecting with others and trying to give them something good in the world. And I definitely felt that my highest purpose was always going to be, in some way, to shine light on the truth. So I was taking voice lessons by 10 and wrote and recorded my first song at 14 about my boyfriend called Only You and Me. It's so embarrassing to think about. No? It was actually a pretty decent pop song. It wasn't bad for, for, for a first song. Um, and I went on to study music at two conservatories for college. Nobody could talk me. None of my Jewish family could talk me into being a doctor or a lawyer. They tried super hard. I was absolutely determined, as you can probably imagine, if you have had any experience with me in any way. Um, I got my first publishing deal at Paramount when I was 26 years old. I was a few years out of college. Um, and I was very fortunate, I've been very fortunate to live my dream of being an artist and a singer and a songwriter and singing from my heart and forming deep connections with audiences all over the world. Uh, that all stopped suddenly as Lyman Bartonella dismantled me as I signed my new deal with Sony three and a half years ago. So what's so bizarre about this strange turn from being an artist to a furious, scorned patient is that when you're a performer, you're told never to show weakness. You're not supposed to say you have a cold, you're not supposed to say you're sick, you're not supposed to say uh, somebody that I love died so it's hard for me to be on stage tonight. Um, but here I am telling you about the worst, most traumatic episode in my entire life and how I was entirely failed and dismissed by mainstream medicine and it almost killed me. 
at all the best New York City institutions. So my life turned upside down after a tick bite on Long Beach Island, New Jersey, July 4th weekend, 2014. I was at my friend's wedding. I didn't hike, I didn't go in the grass, I didn't see a single animal the entire weekend. I just went to the wedding at the house that they rented on a beach. I went to sleep. I woke up and drove back home to New York City, the unwitting carrier of a tick the size of a poppy seed embedded on my shoulder under my bra strap. Um, I will never know for sure, but I'm pretty sure that I was bitten in my sleep. So it sort of blows the whole thing out of the water about being careful when you're outside because I know that you know what was in my bed. Anyway, a few days later, I woke up with a crushing head and neck ache like I have never experienced, and I couldn't stay awake. I fell into this death-like, coma-like sleep for two or three days that I had never experienced. And then a few days later, I felt fine. I thought I was fine. But here's the first hard lesson. If you think you have the summer flu, it's probably Lyme. After my flu episode, I got out of the shower and I wrapped a white towel around me. This is a Saturday, just five days after I came back from New York, back from Long Beach Island, and I saw a bite on my shoulder with the faint ring around it. So I knew what that meant. That's basically all I knew about Lyme, was that faint little bullseye. Um, so I knew what that meant, and I walked to the emergency room, which was a block from my apartment. And I was given a very wrong and inadequate IDSA recommended, the Infectious Disease Society of America, recommended three weeks of doxycycline. I was not informed that this treatment fails up to 61% of the time, according to a study by Danbury Hospital. I think Johns Hopkins puts that number at 36 or 38%. It's very high no matter how you look at it. I was not told that a longer, stronger course could have saved unimaginable heartache for me and for everybody that loves me and is in my life and all the colleagues and um, people at Sony I had just signed this deal with. Uh, I was told that Lyme is easy to diagnose and easy to cure, which of course ends up being the biggest lie of all. The doctors unequivocally said I would be fine. They smugly told me to thank God I was not one of those crazy Lyme people. I've never heard of a crazy line person. I have no idea what they're talking about, but I definitely noted that something was extremely strange about that comment. So I took the antibiotics for the three weeks until the beginning of August. And in the meantime, I followed up with two infectious disease doctors to make sure that I was on the proper course of treatment. Um, Dr. Phillips will readily affirm that I am hypervigilant by nature. He calls me HV. But I want to point out that I didn't know much about Lyme disease, but my instincts were already telling me something very bad was happening to my body. Both of these ID doctors from New York University confirmed that I was on the best, most aggressive treatment and admonished me to stay off the internet researching tick-borne diseases. And I also thought that was a very strange thing to say. I felt okay when I stopped the meds, but I woke up one day in October and my breast was swollen and extremely painful. My internist examined me, she looked extremely alarmed, and she got the head of Mount Sinai Breast Oncology to squeeze me in. I have a very serious family history of breast cancer, and um, she understood that this was potentially ominous. Um, he, was, he did see me and he was very puzzled by my symptoms and acknowledged that they were real, but he had no idea what they were, only that they were not cancer. And that was another lesson, um, that doctors only see what they know. They don't investigate, they don't connect the dots, they don't look at you as a whole person. To him, I was just somebody who didn't have breast cancer and his job was done. But still I went back to him two more times given my family history and I begged him to reevaluate and try to find some reason for my ongoing symptoms. Now I was riddled with extreme panic and anxiety, but not the kind that it's not the kind that is related to a situation. I knew something was wrong, but it was like neuropsych. It wasn't normal to be as crazy as I was feeling. Um, he could see it, he just didn't know. He thought maybe I ate too much soy. I don't eat soy. 
Um, I thought that was pretty stupid. Um, and I, you know, I just kept asking him why, why, why there has to be a reason. So please, if you remember nothing else from my story, please remember that there is always a reason when your body goes haywire. And I advise anybody who's suddenly or chronically ill to not simply accept autoimmunity as cause without asking many more questions. You have to get to the root. You have to get to the root. Because when you get a diagnosis of fibromyalgia or rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic arthritis or MS or Alzheimer's or anxiety, OCD, depression, or other mood disorders, ALS, Understand that these are only descriptions of your symptoms, but they don't answer the real question. And understand that Lyme and other chronic so-called stealth infections like Bartonella, which is also called cat scratch disease, have been scientifically linked to cases of each of these diagnoses that I just mentioned, as well as a variety of others that are labeled autoimmune, neurodegenerative, neuropsychiatric, and psychiatric conditions. If you're new to this, I realize that you may be thinking that this sounds crazy. How can it possibly be that all these diagnoses are linked to tick-borne diseases? Not everything is Lyme and Bartonella. I agree, not everything is Lyme and Bartonella. There could definitely be another cause, and all causes should be explored and investigated and thoroughly ruled out. However, there is no system of the body that Lyme and Bartonella can't infiltrate and attack, and quite often they are the underlying causes of these diseases. They are. A lot. That's why we're here. So until you have these diseases thoroughly ruled out by an ILADS doctor, they're still on the table as far as I'm concerned. The other hard lesson that I learned was don't trust anybody but a Lyme specialist about Lyme. Not an ID doctor, not your pediatrician, never a rheumatologist. What a sham of a field that is. <laughs> I could go on and on about that, but I think you all know. Um, yeah, because you know, your body doesn't just start attacking itself in the absence of a trigger. So please ask your doctors why. And if they don't have an answer that makes sense, you must move on. So for myself, with no answer to my searing pain and swelling, I was extremely, extremely alarmed. I knew in my heart something was terribly wrong. It seemed every day for the next three months I woke up with new, migrating, horrible symptoms and I would think, torture. This is abject. Torture. What did I do to deserve this? I was afraid to go to sleep at night, not knowing what my body would be doing a few hours later. In the meantime, my days were spent going to a million doctors. There are no shortages of them in New York City, I learned, and I saw them all. Over a dozen of them, and I say a dozen, that's just the main ones. I have friends who are doctors, family members who are doctors. I walk down the street, I live near Mount Sinai, I pull strangers over, you have a white coat, what could be wrong with me? I am not kidding you. I was looking for answers everywhere, everywhere. I saw gypsies, psychics, Dr. Phil will tell you I left no stone unturned. It's true. Um, but they dismissed me, they passed me around to each other, uh, they rolled their eyes at me, they said I asked too many questions. By the way, uh, next, don't ever ask a patient. Don't ever tell a patient they ask too many questions. That's, that's a really disgusting way to treat a patient. Uh, especially in the absence of an explanation for my symptoms. If you have no answers, I have a right to ask you as many questions as I want. So I asked them all if the doxy could have failed and I could still have Lyme, and they all said no, based on nothing. They said no. One ID doctor, my favorite, from NYU, Alex McMeeking, had the audacity to say he was sure it wasn't Lyme because he went to medical school and because Doxy kills Lyme 100% of the time in the test tube. That's not true. We all know that's not true. I was treated within five days of my bite and I was still spiraling out of control. I told him I heard that there were actual Lyme specialists and I wanted him to refer me to one. He strongly discouraged that concept and told me that Lyme doctors are quacks. I hate that word. But now, I use it when I talk about people like him. 
My breaking point came during Christmas vacation in 2014, five months after my bite. I concluded that maybe I was just stressed and I went to my friend's farm out in Santa Barbara to rest for two weeks. The morning after I arrived, I suddenly couldn't breathe. There was a vice around my chest. I could not get enough air. I finally Googled all my symptoms and lo and behold, Dr. Burriscano's brilliant Lyme checklist came up and confirmed my suspicion. I had 38 of 60 symptoms on that list. Um, mercifully, my close friend, uh, Jennifer, knew a Lyme literate doctor in San Diego who um, she called and he agreed to see me over Christmas vacation um, very generously. And he accurately and clinically diagnosed me immediately. Um, and that's, I have to say a word about a clinical diagnosis. People talk to me all the time about blood tests. The blood tests are terrible. The blood tests are extremely unreliable. I think most of you in this room know that, but um, if this message gets beyond here, I want the public to know that in the absence of other findings, Lyme disease is a clinical diagnosis made by a doctor evaluating your symptoms and your medical history. Um, so, and, and the blood test produced so many false positives. But he still, he did some blood work and he sent me home with three antibiotic prescriptions and one more memorable piece of advice. Don't go on the internet looking for stories of recovery because the people that get well don't spend their time on message boards. So in that moment, I swore that if I was lucky enough to get better, I would share my hopeful story with as many people who needed to hear it. Little could I have imagined that this is the turn my life would take. So I flew home to New York, I started my treatment, but I knew in my heart that this California doctor was not the right fit for me. I got a list of specialists from all kinds of foundations, but upon researching, none of them felt right to me either. At this point, I'm only going to trust my gut on everything. I've been right the whole time, and I've been misled. So I just kept putting the word out, and at the last minute, somebody that I met on a plane seven years ago who had just bought a house in Vermont who was very well connected. I had a weird gut instinct to email him and say, I think I'm dying from Lyme. You live in New England. Do you know anybody I can see? And his next door neighbor sent me a beautiful letter about Dr. Phillips. And she had heard him speak here several years before that and said, if anybody in my family was going to have to go down this road and get Lyme treatment, if any of us got Lyme, we would see him. So I went on YouTube that night and I watched one of his terrifying talks and I freaked out, but I knew that he was the one. The, the information is so terrifying and sobering. Um, I was lucky enough to get in on a cancellation a few weeks later and slowly but surely he got me well. So as I got better, my rage skyrocketed. I could not believe the injustice and the denial and the crime being perpetrated in medicine by our own government agencies like the CDC who deny the global disaster that is tick-borne disease. I decided to do what I know best and I picked up a pen. And I wrote my story for the Huffington Post, but I really just thought a few, a few dozen people would read it. I could never ever have imagined what this was to become and the outpouring, the outpouring I was to receive. There were harrowing stories from all over the world, from Ghana, Australia, the UK, Canada, Europe, China, all over the United States. One story worse than the next. People sent me photos of themselves healthy and then in a wheelchair six months later. They sent pictures of their children in zombie-like states. They told me they lost their homes, their spouses, their children, their dignity, their ability to walk. They lost their souls. Some went blind, and many said they wished they could die, and that they would die rather than lead this broken life. A handsome attorney from the Midwest wrote to me asking for help, saying that he couldn't suffer anymore. I immediately replied with the reinsurance that there was hope. I urged him not to give up, and I passed along the name of a wonderful clinician that I just read about near him. Two weeks later, I learned he committed suicide. My life has been sharply refocused and my soul has been immensely changed by your stories. 
I take them so completely to heart, where they have fueled my mission to expose the breathtaking truth of these infections and the organized, concerted effort by mainstream thought leaders to deny it, cover it up, and profit from it. Uh, if you want to understand more about the profiting part, I would recommend that you watch the uh, brilliant documentary, Oscar shortlisted documentary, Under Our Skin, and go down the rabbit hole on their website and see the unbelievable freedom of information docs that they've uncovered, the kind of collusion between uh, various, you know, the CDC, NIH, the IDSA, and others. It's really shocked to me. Um, so there's no proper test for Lyme. There's no cure. It's a chronic stealth bacteria. They are both, like uh, Barnella as well. It's chronic stealth infections that evade standard blood tests and can make your brain, heart, joints, and gut its permanent home. There is so little money to fund this pandemic, which has more sufferers than breast cancer, colon cancer, and HIV combined, that patients are de desperately trying to fund it ourselves. Doctors are not trained to recognize Lyme. They don't look for it, yet they confidently dismiss it. You have to ask. They're still gonna dismiss it, but you gotta ask. They're a dogmatic and largely uncurious bunch I always call them sheep following the bad CDC guidelines while their patients fall apart before them. Millions around the world are suffering because this truth has been suppressed. Lyme patients are the most disenfranchised, sickest group in medicine, cast aside as if we don't exist. It's a crime that medical students are given 15 minutes of incorrect education on what our friend Neil Spector Duke oncologist calls a disease as complicated and virulent as cancer. Speaking of Neil, who I call my earth angel, he is the most magical person, I want to end by telling you a bit about the mission we're on along with the extraordinary Dr. Stephen Phillips and how a little serendipity and an inexplicable force brought the three of us together. Uh, as I was recovering, I read Neil's gorgeous memoir. It really is the most stunning book I've ever read, and I like to read a lot. Uh, Gone in a Heartbeat. I read it in one Sunday afternoon, and it was the first book I was able to read in 13 months um, due to my cognitive issues from Lyme, and it was really one of the best I've ever read. And I felt compelled, like everybody else who reads his book, the poor guy gets inundated with zillions of emails, I felt compelled to write to him and thank him for his book and for sharing his story and being so honest. And uh, he gave me so much hope. I still was not completely well. Um, and I didn't ask him to reply, and I didn't expect to hear back from him. But I did. A few hours later, I received a beautiful, heartfelt letter from him. And I was walking down Third Avenue and heard my phone go off, and I just burst into tears when I read it. I just was so touched. I'll never forget it. And, and we corresponded back and forth, and we became friends. And it quickly became apparent to me that he had to meet Dr. Phillips. I just knew that the power of their minds coming together could change this stagnant landscape. So getting the two of the most in-demand doctors from different states in the same room was not going to be easy, but I was quite determined, or you would call me relentless, Steve. Um, so Neil was coming to New York City, and I got, to, I got Steve to agree to come to dinner with us, and it was there that, uh, you, that you shared your idea for a potential cure for Bartonella, and Neil said, wow, I'd love to bring you guys to Duke and present this to my lab of immunology and oncology PhDs and see if this could, they think this could be as game-changing as I do. And here we are, the rest is history. We formed a company around it, and with the help of Lyme Connection, we've been raising money, and uh, we, we're so thrilled to tell you we were just awarded uh, the Bay Area Lyme Foundation's $100,000 uh, Emerging Leader Award grant. Uh, Dr. Phillips received that just over the weekend. It, it's going to uh, fund our first in vitro study. And we will proudly be partnering with Ed Breitschwart and his team at Galaxy. Uh, I'll let Dr. Phillips elaborate more on the research. As far as my role goes, I call myself a doctor wrangler. They call me the nucleus, which is really disgusting but awesome. Um, I had to Google it after you said it. It's like, oh. All right, that's, that's what I am now. Um, in the midst of all of this, um, uh, Dr. Phillips and I were approached by an agent to write a book together, and we signed a major book deal just last week. You're the first to know. So we're excited to be hopefully 
doing our parts to move this conversation forward, just like our friend Liliania, and just like all of you here on Lime Connection. Um, so I wanted to just end by saying, I am okay, I am better. I am a hopeful story. So if you have horrible days, please remember me, and please know that I was hopeless and lying in bed and couldn't breathe three years ago and thought I was dead and writing goodbye letters to my loved ones. I think the tides are changing. I think there's hope on the horizon. Uh, please don't give up, and we're not going to stop fighting for you in the meantime.